the question. What was what was the title of that? Uh, Bluegrass goes to college. Should it? Should it? Uh, yes, but should it? But should it? But should it? Right. Yeah. yeah. I can think about this for a minute. Hi, I'm Dan Boner, director of East Tennessee State University's Bluegrass Old Time and Country Music Program here in Johnson City, Tennessee. And I have two of my esteemed colleagues, if you will. Um, to my right here is Dr. Nate Olson. Howdy. And, uh, of course, faculty emeritus and founder of our program way back in 1982. This is Mr. Jack Tottle. Hi. So, our good friend, and, and I want to start by saying that Ted Lehman is our friend. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He and Irene are uh, great folks. We see them at a lot of festivals out on the road when I'm traveling with Becky. Um, but he does pose a question, and it's gotten some attention here in the last day or two. Jack, in the early days of the program, you had a lot of concern from people, administrators or faculty or maybe even community members about institutionalizing this music. Um, well, uh, yeah, of course, being put in an institution is, uh, has different connotations <coughs> in different places. <laughs> However, uh, definitely people were asking a lot of questions. In fact, reading the, um, the No Depression uh, article made me think of, you know, I've been dealing with some of these same questions since 45 years ago when I started the program. There were a lot of people who thought bluegrass is, is not what we should be teaching in a university. After all, we're in Appalachia. We want to be showing that we have something modern, forward-looking. As one gentleman remarked, we need to show the world we have something to offer besides bluegrass. Are institutions just seeing um, this style of music as a, as a, uh, a way to recruit I think he says something like aspiring young adolescents who are on fire for the music. My argument would be, you know, there aren't a great deal. We meet a lot of incoming students and prospects, and some of them are interested in the music. Some have been playing all their lives. Some have just heard about it, and a certain percentage, they don't even know what they want to major in. They might not even play that well. They're just looking for a place. And it's hard to know when you're 18 years old what you want to do for the rest of your life. And it's also a, a problem, I think, in society that we um, project a college education as the thing you have to do for your, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and that we associate the college education with, uh, well, this is going to be your job. And so you decide now and then you work all the way for it. And, what better thing than for a few young people who maybe go to festivals and they're so on fire for the music that they practice all day long yeah. and they want a place to go. I didn't have a place to go until you all created a place. Yeah. And uh, I would also add that our program didn't grow by any mandate. It was an organic process. Mm -hmm. um, no person said, you are going to start a music program and offer bluegrass, old-time country and Celtic music. It, it just it formed out of this idea that you had. And, uh, and it, there was a need for people who wanted to study this music seriously. I think so. And for young people to be passionate about something is really great, mm. <laughs> other than video games and all of the other stereotypical things. Yeah. Plus, they're passionate about something that is legal, that is, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, encourages creativity, mm. it um, encourages discipline, it helps you understand how to deal with the world in many levels, not just musical. Mm -hmm. um, so I know so many people who would <laughs> wish their kids were deeply into some kind of music that would keep them out of trouble. Indeed. Well, yeah, and I think like any college program, I mean, we, we want to meet that passion and, exactly. you know, cultivate it in a constructive way where those individuals, you know, make something of the passion that they have. I mean, that's what, that's what a college program is intended to do. That's what our college program is intended to do. It's not just a place to hang out and jam. That's right. Yeah, we're not right? just jamming. There might be a um, misunderstanding that 
that yeah. what we do in these college programs is just jam. We just get together and pick, and yeah. and there's an instructor there, but they don't really say anything. Um, you know, w when I think of working with professionals in 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 bluegrass music, um, I meet people who have been in this music a long time who can't write a chart, mm -hmm. who. Um, which I'm not saying that they need to write a chart to be a good musician, but you know how much better would you be of a musician if you could um, you could communicate that idea of what you want to play with others yeah. through a chart, something that you can write down, tabulate, mm -hmm. something that people in this music have been using for a long time. Um, in recording, you know, we're we're here in the beautiful ETSU recording laboratory, and uh, students get to learn about. You know, microphone techniques, they get to learn the three to one ratio uh, of miking and, and how that works for stereo and the, the importance of uh, destructive interference, phase relationships, all these scientific and physics terms that, you know, we can apply to bluegrass music. And it doesn't diminish the art form. In fact, it enhances it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of want to go back to this question that you asked Jack about, you know, institution institutionalizing an art form like bluegrass music that's that's kind of grown up sort of organically and doesn't have all of the, I don't know, maybe the formal kinds of learning that are attached to like classical music, for example. And I think that, you know, there, and, and Ted brings this up in the article too, he kind of, you know, there, it, right, rightly so, there is an issue about that, that when, you know, non-classical musics come into institutions, sometimes there are problems, you know, and a lot of times you know, the classical music culture wants that other music to sort of assimilate to it. Yes. And, I mean, you know, probably the best example of this is jazz music. You know, 40 years ago, jazz music was a lot more improvisational. It was a lot less hierarchical, for example. You know, there was a lot more sort of mentorship and those kinds of things. But as it's become institutionalized, it's become a lot more like that. It's a lot more notated. You know, there's a conductor standing up there now telling you what to do. In fact, I've seen sheet music that has all the breaks written out in the music. Mm. You don't even have to improvise anymore to play a lot of jazz music. And a lot of academics have argued this, that as jazz has become more institutionalized, that it's kind of lost its characteristics of you know, jazz. I see. And so, so I, yeah, I think this is a fragile thing that, we, that we're trying to be very careful about, that we don't want these very special things about bluegrass music to be compromised in the institution, and it's something that we have to pay a lot of sort of attention to and be diligent about, because there is, I think, a, sort of an impetus for that to happen. And you know, to Jack's credit and to Raymond's credit and the other people that came into this program, they, you know, they stuck to their guns and said, "We're not going to compromise these things that are so, you know, critical to bluegrass right. music culture. We're going to make those things part of the institution." And I think that that's that's what we have to do. Indeed. John Hartford once uh, said, in fact, he said it in the liner notes to one of the uh, recordings of the ETSU Bluegrass Band back in the late 80s when uh, Tim Stafford and Adam Steffi and Barry Bales were among the uh, extremely talented students that we had. And John uh, wrote for the liner notes, any program in a school, in an academic setting, should make sure that it doesn't turn it into something sterile, mm -hmm. into something without the joy, without the excitement, without the uh, discovery that music makes possible, particularly bluegrass, because it has, because it is not written down for the most part, and you're forced to learn from the way people played who have made huge contributions to it, and then you've got to do something yourself. In a college setting, there's this really great thing that happens that doesn't happen as much when you're out on the road, so to speak. And that is, you have a mentor that you can work with. Mm -hmm. And you heard all the great bluegrass artists talk about Bill Monroe as the mentor. Mm -hmm. When they worked with him, it was like going to school. Yeah. Or when you went to work with, if you go now to work with Doyle Lawson or, who, or whoever it may be, they, they had a way of um, helping those artists to grow their own style, 
but at the same time understand the formula for bluegrass music. Yeah. And it, it was the type of thing that we can do now as instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that we have a faculty of um, intelligent, thoughtful teachers who can play this music at a very high level. Otherwise, they can't inspire students. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the people on our faculty that we do. Yeah. Um, and to have somebody like that that you can work with every week mm -hmm. and you can, it would be like studying, you know, knee to knee with, uh, you know, any of the great artists over the generations, you know, mm -hmm. to, to actually sit there with Adam Steffi and say, hey, that's a good idea you've got there. Let's run with it. Let's, what else can you do? How mm -hmm. can you make this break different? You have a really cool class you've been teaching uh, recently. Um, why don't you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about this because I think what we, what we try to do, you know, in in college settings, and, and, and I think we do this at, try to do this at ETSU, is that it's more than just about learning a bunch of facts. It's more than just knowledge, right? It's about having experiences that are sort of richly educational. Like, you know, you asked this question about, you know, what does, what does a college education, what can a college education offer? You know, and I think this is part of it. It's like these experiences that are, you know, super rich, sort of educationally, like performing a lot. And that's one of the things that our students here do a lot. They perform all the time, and they get used to that interaction, that the experience of performing, which is such a critical thing to have as a, if you want to be a successful performer, obviously, right? You have to perform a lot. So we try to create, you know, opportunities for that kind of experience to happen. So yeah. So the other thing that you're referring to is. You know, we have we have a lot of students in our program that are that are trying to sort of push the boundaries of genre and think creatively about sort of what's next, what's the next sort of progressive acoustic thing that's going to happen, and so we've developed this class that that tries to speak to these students and facilitate that you know that that kind of uh, progress, and so in the class we we meet together and we talk about we you know we listen to a lot of music, we talk about what we hear other sort of cutting edge musicians are doing. And then we, you know, I assign them a bunch of activities to help them sort of create, you know, uh, cultivate their creative capacity. And they, um, you know, compose or write new pieces of music, arrange new pieces of music, and then perform for each other almost every week. So, the, you know, they're engaged in this, this, I don't know, cycle of creativity where they're thinking creatively all the time, performing for each other, critiquing each other, Getting feedback from you know me and then also one another, yeah. which is often the most you know valuable feedback you can get is from people that are doing this, trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do, you know, on, on a, at a really high level. You want them to listen to your stuff and be like, oh, this is what I hear. This is so yeah. So we've tried to create an experience around that that's more than just here's some academic facts about compositional techniques or whatever, yeah. but like let's do this together. Let's you know let's let's collaborate. Let's have a collective. Where we're trying to, you know, push the boundaries of what we can do, and I think we as educators we learn as much from our students as oh, well. It's all the time. We're always learning from them. Yeah. Um, and I w I would also take that a step further and say that um, I knew what I was going to say and I lost it. Dang it. Well, what I, what I was going to say is yeah, it's like it's a community. It's like we're part of the community. And yeah, maybe we might have you know a, a different kind of experience that we can contribute to that. But I think our students have a very interesting kind of experience as well. And but what they bring to the table to you know communicate about is really interesting as well. And I think mm -hmm. we're trying to tap into that and not just say, you know, we're kind of the masters from on high and we'll show you what to do. <laughs> but we're like, no, we're exploring this together. There's a lot to you know latch yeah. onto. There's a lot to think about. Let's. Let's think about this stuff together, because that always is richer than just me on my computer. Indeed. Seeing what's online, you know? And these types of, uh, you know, we're really facilitating that as, as instructors rather than mandating it. Yeah. Um, and the types of material that, that students are creating, I've sat in on your class too, and it's, yeah. it's really fun. It's fun. Because they get excited, and they're like, man, I never thought about it that way. Let me try this musical idea or this musical idea. Yeah. And, you know, isn't that what we want in this music? Uh, it's not that we... For the same token, we're also um, 
trying to help students understand the past history of the music yeah. in order to inform their decisions into the future. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because how how can they be well informed if all they listen to is one particular banjo style? If they only listen to Earl Scruggs, I mean that would be pretty cool to only listen to Earl Scruggs. <laughs> I love Earl Scruggs, but you know. Listen to Noam Bikilny, listen to, uh, you know, all of these, Bela Fleck, I mean, you actually gave Bela Fleck his first professional job, right? Right. Years ago. Right, with the Tasty Licks band, and uh, and I pushed Bela to write new material, mm -hmm. because we wanted to do as much as we could in the band, and Bela was right out of high school, he was probably 18 or 19 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, he was, he expressed later that he was glad that I did that, and he certainly, uh, <laughs> kept up with that for the rest of his career. To say the least. Yeah. Ted asks, are the students being fooled into thinking that a degree in bluegrass or traditional music can provide a satisfactory living for most or even many of its graduates? I mean, I think that's, that's an important question. Uh, Valuable question, Ted. Yeah. Thank you for asking it. Yeah, and I've been thinking, since I read this and we've been talking about it, I've been thinking especially about just a particular student that comes to mind who kind of exemplifies what I want to say about that. And this was a student who came in the same time that I was hired about three years ago. And his name's Joe Cicero. And he, uh, when he first came in, he had a lot of passion, man. He was, he was driven and he had a lot to say. But I think technically on the instrument, he just didn't have the skill that he needed to say what he wanted to say. And I've been thinking about what, you know, the program has offered him in the three years that I've sort of seen him progress while he's been here. And I think one of the, one of the biggest things that's happened for Joe is that he has had a chance to really invest a significant amount of time in just practicing and getting really good at knowing how to work his instrument, you know, how to do things on his instrument. And especially being around people that can give him really focused directed feedback on on the things that are hard for him the things that he's that he's ch that, are, that challenge him you know mm -hmm. and trying to and figuring out how to do that he's he's been taking voice from me yeah, he's been taking voice from you he's like he's, he works hard yeah he works hard he's a good student he's trying to figure out how to say what he wants to say well right mm -hmm. he's been taking lessons from Wyatt Rice as well and like so so I've watched Joe you know over the course of these 3 years and he has really gotten a lot more facility on his instrument and he's He's started to be able to say the things that he wanted that he's wanted to say this whole time, and it's really empowering to see that. Like, you know, he's becoming self-actualized because of this experience that he's having here. You know, and you know, do you need college to do that? Maybe not. Probably not. But can college provide you with a lot of resources to make that happen? I mean, you bet. Where, 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 anywhere can you go? One place and work in a studio, you can talk to scholars about the music. If you have a question, you can talk to somebody like Ted Olson, who yeah. you know, is a Grammy-nominated uh, you know, music producer, and, or, or the, the practical artists that we have here, the scholars, the, the, the researchers that we have, yeah. um, the specialists. Mm -hmm. You have, a, you have a, a group of specialists here that, that are a great resource for students. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great investment. Yeah. It, and talking about actual figures, which I think sometimes people don't understand, uh, those of us who work here and we have to help students through the process of being admitted, uh, we deal with this a lot. For one thing, ETSU is a regional institution. Mm -hmm. It's a state university. And so the tuition is relatively affordable compared to private schools. Yeah. Um, so we also have um, out-of-state tuition waivers where students can attend in-state. In fact, 70% of our students are from out-of-state right now but or they, or international. But almost all of them attend at the in-state rate, isn't that right? They all attend at the in-state rate, just yeah. about every single one. Yeah. And then of that, um, there are also a lot of Pell Grants, there are lottery scholarships, there's financial aid of other forms. Even if a student did have to pay a full annual tuition at a state institution of $8,000, if you don't have $8,000, you don't have it. But I can think of a lot 
less useful things you could spend eight thousand dollars on and if you stretch it out over four years you know thirty two thousand dollars is certainly a lot less than a motor home that travels to bluegrass festivals day you know, week after week after week right and it also hopefully will appreciate in value over years that's right <laughs> I've felt that so many people do not end up working in the specific area that they studied in college. Mm -hmm. And what I think that I learned most from college, my degree was in political science. So I, I learned the mandolin largely by myself and learned to perform professionally and uh, go on the road and so forth. I did not have a degree in bluegrass because there weren't any. Um, but. In college, I did have to learn how to focus, how to study hard, yeah. how to not get distracted by um, irrelevant things. I, I <laughs> learned, yeah, only music was the only distraction I had. Uh, and, and you learn teamwork that you learn in, in, the, uh, in the program here, rather than just a bunch of folks all trying to do something musical on their own, there is some structure, there are goals, and there is somebody to help you learn how to be mutually supportive of one another. That's a very valuable trait to be able to have, whether it's in music or in any other kind of work. Um, and the ability to communicate, to either through writing or through speaking, those are other traits that you see not everyone has, College is an opportunity mm -hmm. to learn those uh, those skills. No, and uh, the idea that no, you don't have to to go to college to play bluegrass quite well, but you may be missing other things in your life that would enrich it if you did that, and it might make you uh, might give you more opportunities than if you're just a hot guitar player uh, or whatever. And I remember Sam Bush, when uh, the great mandolin player who has won many awards and uh, is uh, viewed by many people as, as one of the, the great mandolin icons. When Sam heard about the ETSU Bluegrass program, he said, man, if there had been a program like that when I was growing up in college, I probably would have gone to college. Mm -hmm. At all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, looking more towards the history, we also have some folks who are very interested in the scholarly aspect of this music right. and the research and telling the story because um, mm -hmm. we need, you know, people to tell this story. I, I remember when I was a kid and I was reading liner notes by Neil Rosenberg and Charles mm -hmm. Wolfe and those guys, it was like somebody was talking about this music yeah. with importance, the way that... Maybe people around me who didn't understand the music or maybe stereotyped it, um, they weren't talking about it in that way. And all of a sudden you have these guys who are analyzing that music in a way yeah. that legitimizes it. And it, it was very important to me as a person. Yeah, I think that that's, that's happening more and more. That, that, you know, bluegrass and old time music and these other genres that we're kind of exploring here, they all are more and more worthy of academic, you know, scrutiny about of academic investigation. And this style of music is perfect for music educators. Oh yeah. Because it hits on a lot of the hottest topics in music education. Your uh, doctor is in music ed. Yeah. Uh, I am one class away from a master's of music education. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, trying to do better. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of discussion about the old ways of, of teaching music, and there's this disconnect of, um, you know, when, whenever a, a person learns to speak as a child, you know, they, first they, they, they're brought up and they, they learn to imitate sound. They, mm -hmm. they hear their father and their mother, and they, they try to form these words and sounds, and then it eventually turns into words, and then before too long they learn how to write, and then after a while they learn the theory behind writing. Mm -hmm. um, somehow in music 200 years ago we got it backwards. Yeah. They, they, they started with here's a piece of paper, um, this note means this on your instrument. There's a, a kinesthetic thing like 
yeah. you know, um, rather than it audiation with, and, yeah. and, uh, and it hearing. It starts with theory instead it of... It starts with the theory and the writing and then goes yeah. backwards. And then there's then you end up with all these violinists who want to learn to play fiddle. Yeah. And uh, they have difficulty learning how to improvise and how to hear pitch without having a piece of paper in front of them. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there is a, there is like a, a revolution starting to happen in music education right now where music educators are talking a lot more about this. And they want to sort of break down this model of choir, orchestra, band, and that's all we do in high school. But think about how do we, you know, help people become sort of whole musicians mm. and know how to do all these kinds of things, compose and improvise and, you know, think musically about their life. And so, yeah, I mean, bluegrass is right there and old time music as well has the same kinds of opportunities you know mm -hmm. and i think that you know as educators continue to talk about those things they'll turn to those of us who have been working in those areas for 20 years trying to figure out how to help you know these students become great musicians beyond just the page Yes. Right. And the community engagement that's part of that. Right. The bluegrass community is that way. You go to a festival and you see this social structure. You see the artists on stage. You see the, the jammers in the campground. You see mm. all these people mingling and talking together. Then you have the, the people who are doing the stage management, the promotion, and the record sales, and the t-shirts, and the merch. And you got all these people who love the thing. They love the art form. Yeah. Which is why I know that Ted and Irene go to festivals. They love being part of this community. Yeah. They fit into it as well. Mm -hmm. College fits into it as well. Yeah. It's, it's about time that college is a part of bluegrass music and bluegrass is a part of college as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. One cool thing that's on the horizon here in our program, I uh, had lunch yesterday with a lady who we're talking about te teaching some business courses. Mm. And she has a lifelong experience in, in the legal profession. She's helped many artists. She is good friends with a lot of bluegrass artists. And she laid out a curriculum just for one course alone that I think would help a lot of our students who are interested in going into into making music their profession in any sense, whether as a performer or whether working in some other aspect of the field, just understanding um, limited liability corporations, mm -hmm. understanding tax codes, mm -hmm. understanding um, contracts and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're going to write a book, what does a book contract need to look like? Right. If you're going to do a performance, if you're going to do a recording, um, if you're going to be a band together, if you're going to own property together, yeah. how do you set those up? Mm -hmm. How do you do that in a way that you can own things and not get burned by all of the, the people out there that just want to, to leech off of your success? Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to be a, a great progress here in the next semester or two as we start moving into more of the, the business side of uh, helping students turn what they enjoy doing into some sort of financial uh, back, uh, backing. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you'd like to find out more about East Tennessee State University's Bluegrass Old Time Celtic and Country Music Program, visit us online. You can go to www.etsu.edu, do a quick search for Bluegrass, and you'll find us. And again, I hope everybody does take the time to read Ted Lehman's article in No Depression. Uh, I do appreciate uh, him mentioning our programs and the many college programs, and it is a very good question. I'm glad, Ted, that you did ask it because it's the type of question that we get a lot, and we want to be able to answer it for as many people uh, who are interested. So, um, Again, I'm Dan Boner, director of ETSU's Bluegrass Old Time and Country Music Program, and we'll see you down the line somewhere. <laughs>